Welcome to Sheboygan County Government, working for you. My name is Adam Payne, County Administrator and co-host of this program with Chairman Roger Destruti. And this month, as we've been doing for a number of years now, we like to bring in a department head to talk about the roles and responsibilities of their department and upcoming activities. And I'm very pleased to introduce a new department head. You, you probably have read his name in the paper or perhaps met him personally, but our first TV8 program with Mr. John Dolson, our county clerk. Welcome, John. Glad to be here. John was elected in November, just started in January, following the heels of uh, County Clerk Julie Glancy after a long, stellar career. But of course, uh, change is inevitable, and we welcome John, and he's been helping make good things happen. And John, please start by sharing with our viewers a little bit about your background. A little bit about me. My wife and I and our two children moved to Sheboygan 18 years ago, and I absolutely love it. And uh, I've been um, in the private banking and financial advising business for many years prior to running for county clerk. And family? Uh, daughter's 23, name's Bailey, and my son Davis is 21. And what did you say, 18 years now in the county? 18 years. So do you feel like you're a... We are Sheboyganites. You're Sheboyganites. Yes. I know there's a cutoff there somewhere. Well, it's good to have you with us. What inspired you to run for county clerk? I've been involved um, with a lot of friends uh, in their campaigns that have run for different positions, either locally or even at the state level. And I had a desire to uh, serve the public and talk to a lot of friends. They said they thought uh, I'd be good uh, in a public office. So I started researching where I might start, and my efforts uh, fell on the county level. And um, then, then researching more into that, realized uh, that my background uh, worked more uh, towards the county clerk position. And um, realizing then that Julie Glancy was retiring, the position was opened up and thought now is my time to run. Yeah, yeah, well, very good. And what have your impressions been so far? I know it's only been a what, five, six months now? But uh... Six months, it's great. It's uh, busy. It's uh, a lot of facets uh, changing daily. People coming in. We're almost a storefront for the county doing passports and marriage licenses and whatnot, and then um, monthly with the county board. So you, so you just touched on a few of the areas, but right. can I give a snapshot? What are the, the roles and responsibilities of the county clerk's office? Primarily, the county clerk is the secretary to the county board. They assist with running the county board meetings, uh, coming up with the agendas, posting agendas for not only the county board, but the other standing committees for the county. And um, uh, then uh, formalizing the uh, minutes after the county board meetings and working with um, uh, marriage licenses for the county, taking applications for marriage licenses. Um, overseeing elections for the county. Which is huge. That's, that's a, a big role. It doesn't come around, but in the spring and fall and in certain years. Uh, but that's a big part of the business. And you just touched on passports, for example. As you well know, and certainly Chairman Testruti, the county is the right arm of state government, and most of what we do is required. The county board may authorize other programs or services. I think most mm -hmm. of what the county clerk does is required by state law. But there are some permissive uh, programs and services you provide, and of course, right. passports is one of them. Right. Uh, the ones required is, uh, like we said, being secretary to the board, uh, running the elections, uh, administering dog tags, uh, the dog tag program to the different municipalities in the county, and um, and. Uh, overseeing the marriage license process. And the ones that are um, a la carte, if you will, for the county are uh, being a passport acceptance agency, application acceptance agency for the State Department, and then um, being a resource for the DNR for hunting and fishing licenses, as well as vehicle registrations like snowmobiles, ATVs, um, boat licenses, for boats under 16 feet, things of that nature. 
And as an outdoorsman, I sure appreciate being able to just go downstairs in the administration building and uh, get excellent customer service. And it seems like I'm only in there a couple of minutes when I want to get my patron uh, hunting and fishing license. And I think it's it's a one of the better kept secrets, really, because I know Fleet Farm is very busy with selling licenses. The DNR office in Plymouth is busy, but they've now reduced their hours, and right. it can be a little less convenient. So right. if you're watching this program and you're an outdoorsman, like to hunt or fish, uh, stop on in the county clerk's office, and you'll have some real nice folks who can help you. And, and it just doesn't seem like the wait or the line is as long right. at your office. Easy in and out parking. Uh, we're right on the first floor. It costs the same whether you come to our office or go to Gander Mountain or wherever. And then how many staff do you have and what's your annual operating budget? Three staff, uh, two of them very weathered, been with the office for quite a long time working with the retired Julie Glancy, who was a uh, clerk for 18 years. And um, it's roughly a half million dollar operating budget. Yeah. But also one very new employee um, I don't know. If, I don't recall her name right uh, now. Oh, Leah so Ann Gilson. Leigh she Ann Gilson, started yeah. uh, a couple weeks ago. Yeah. Uh, she filled a uh, position that uh, Dave Warewine had uh, filled, and Dave retired after being with the county for almost 25 years. Right. And in the clerk's office for, I think it was 16 years. Yeah. Yeah. Very good. And what have you found personally to be some of the more challenging responsibilities associated with being the department head and, and running a county clerk's office? Well, there's, uh, it's, I said earlier, it's multifaceted. There's, you are juggling a lot of hats. Uh, but the biggest challenge probably to me coming in uh, was programming the uh, election equipment and coming off the heels of other counties down south that uh, had elections kind of go awry. The pressure's there that, you know, you have to perform and and everyone's watching on election night and everything went well uh, but that was a big challenge. And that's a great transition to you Roger. Yes and as most of you are aware there's a lot of elections that have taken place in the, the past few years and um, most recently has been the uh, primary elections. Let's start with that. Could you tell us a little bit when and where they occur and uh, how many uh, different polling places you get uh, affected with? Sure. The primary that was in February, there was a few races that needed uh, that warranted a primary. Um, that was a smaller election, but that uh, gave way to the April election, which this year it was primarily for um, the smaller municipalities, well, all municipalities for that matter, but um, aldermanic races, mayoral races, uh, village presidents, village clerks, treasurers, constables. Uh, it was quite a large election and, and coming off the heels that I just missed with the outgoing uh, Julie Glancy was the November election as the presidential. And the interesting thing is a lot of people think the presidential is uh, the end-all be-all. It's just a nightmare of elections and it's massive. Well, it is and it isn't. It is in terms of turnout. It's a presidential. It seems everyone gets out to vote. Um, but the, uh, the interesting thing is the spring elections are actually much, much larger. For instance, the November election, there were 10 races on the ballot. This is boring election stuff, but it's what I do and I love it. So there were 10 races on the November uh, ballots. And um, there were six different ballot styles. In the April election, there were 110 races and 81 different ballot styles. So, and if you look inward at what I do, it's all the designing of the ballots, programming of the elections, and making sure everything's right, right down to the you know, village constable. Um, it's the, the spring elections are 10 times a presidential election as far as what goes on to make it happen. Yet the turnout Yet is the less. The turnout is less, and people, they're like, ah, 
it's just a local election. I'll be there. Uh, most people don't know that. Uh, please tell our viewers a little bit about uh, the county clerk's role in coordinating all of that uh, and how does that happen and for instance you have a lot of part-time poll workers that need to act professionally at the polls you're you're uh, involved with that also correct the training correct uh, I haven't done any training yet to date because Julie had had uh, taken care of that prior to her leaving for that period uh, so I will be doing that again and filling her shoes. Um, the county clerk doesn't um, run elections per se as what happens on election day. They administer the election process, train uh, the municipal clerks, and make sure everything is done um, to the statutes with the Government Accountability Board. And um, there's five or six volunteer poll workers at each polling location times uh, I think there's 47 polling locations in the county and on top of that the uh, d different municipal um, employees like clerks, deputy clerks uh, for the towns and villages and in addition to my staff of three and myself the numbers it, it's uh, over 200 people that are involved on any given election day. The uh, State Elections Accountability Board has a very user-friendly website. Do you want to tell our viewers a little bit about that? Sure, it's myvote.wi.gov and uh, there's uh, a lot of helpful resources on there, um, especially if you are in the military or are going to be traveling overseas or just traveling in general and you need to get information on absentee uh, ballots that's all ready, readily available if you're not sure if you're new to the area or some um, after the census that some of the district lines changed and you're not sure where to vote you can go to that website type in your information and it'll tell you the municipality that you're in, uh, as well as um, who's running in the different races. All of the information that we input for our election equipment and ballots needs to then get uploaded to the Government Accountability Board uh, through their state voter registration system. and um, It's a duplication of the the process but it's all all the information that we have we have to get to them so they can have it accessible on their website for the for the taxpayers at myvote.wi.gov I remember uh, several years ago there used to be different polling times at different locations now it's uniform throughout the uh, county that's very helpful and th those uh, t times never change whatever election it is Correct. That, that time yeah. is 7 to 8 p.m. 7 right? to 8 p.m. 7 a.m. to 8 p.m. Mm -hmm. so that, and that's consistent across the state. Mm -hmm. That's uh, There used to be some confusion on that, but that's mm -hmm. been uh, a good change. Are there some other changes that have uh, happened in the past few years that, uh, that will affect some of our voters in the upcoming elections, or are they in place? or? They're in place. There are some things that are uh, going through the legislature right now. Um, we'll wait and see what comes of it, but some things are on campaign finance. Um, but then with the times, some things that they are trying to do is, is regulate when people can apply for absentee ballots. That is, that is kind of massaged per the municipality. A lot of uh, outlying municipalities are uh, part-time or they might have office hours in their home with their home phone number after five o'clock. They might be a farmer during the day and town clerk slash treasurer at night and on the weekends. So they kind of may do with the locals in their area. The state is trying to come by, some people with the state are trying to come by and say, nope, we gotta have it like business hours, eight to five, up until the Friday before the election, things of that nature. And that, that doesn't always work. That might work in the city of Sheboygan, but maybe not in the town of Mitchell or something you know smaller in the remote areas in the different counties. 
especially counties that are uh, up in northern Wisconsin where there's 10, 15,000 people in the county, most of those municipalities are pretty remote and small and they massage the hours when they need to for the locals in that town. Thank you, John. And in addition to changes, and I know it's been a few years now, but we also had to change some of the voting machines that were accessible to people. I, I know I still haven't used any of the touch type voting machines. I use the old paper process, which I'm comfortable with, but what alt options are out there now? Well, recently um, there was the Help America Voters Act uh, that came out, which required every municipality in the country to have uh, handicap accessible uh, ADA compliant voter equipment. And another element of that was to have a um, electronic screen uh, with the capability of audio. So uh, blind people can put on the earphones, they have a, a handpiece with a joystick kind of operation and it walks them through uh, the ballot. So we not only program the optical scan machines that most people are comfortable with where they connect an arrow and put it through the machine. The machine reads it and tabulates uh, with the, the newer uh, touch screen machines with the audio capability. Um, they're able to um, absolutely have everyone um, pretty much with any disability get out uh, to vote. Yet anyone can use it even if whether yeah. you're disabled or not. And a lot of people do. Yeah. A lot of people just don't want to get away from the paper ballots right. and they go and use a touch screen right. and it walks them through it and then it verifies when you're at the end of your your vote you can double check it and then hit enter right. uh, so you can change it more easily than if you you know, if you fill in an arrow on a paper ballot, they've got to issue you another ballot if you want to change your vote. I see. Yeah. And I, I imagine the younger generation is probably going to appreciate more of that touch screen, and it's the a little usage zippier is than the, uh, increasing. Yeah. Every election. Right. Very good. Well, earlier you you talked about very briefly the, the passports and the the DNR licenses, the marriage licenses, and for the passports and the marriage licenses in particular. Obviously, um, the mar let's start with the marriage licenses. Very important function of your office. I see a lot of folks of all ages coming through from time to time to get that very important marriage license. Mm -hmm. What do they need to bring along with them to make sure they're prepared and aren't told, no, you have to come back? Yeah, um, that's a good question. Uh, yeah, photo identification is obviously uh, one of the main things you need. Proof of residency to show that you are in a uh, resident of the county, resident of the state, uh, wherever you're going to be getting married. Um, and um, uh, the certified birth certificate. That's where a lot of people, they just bring in the old uh, black and white sheet that they have from their parents, you know, tucked away in an envelope somewhere, and that's an actual photocopy of the certified birth certificate. When you need an actual certified birth certificate with the um, embossed uh, impression from the Register of Deeds office. If they don't have a, let's start at the beginning there, if they don't have a license, for example, a, a photo of themselves, is there, are there different forms of photo ID that they can bring in? Uh, typically it's the state issued photo ID. If they're not a driver, you right. get a lot of those. Okay, but that's that's if they yeah. but so if they're not a driver, they'll go get the uh, state issued one just to show that they're a yeah. citizen or a resident of that area. Right. And then the birth certificate, if they don't have the certified birth certificate, they can go right upstairs to a register of if deeds office. If they were born in Sheboygan County, right. they but can if, go upstairs to the register of deeds office and and uh, purchase a, a certified. And if they weren't born in Sheboygan County. If they County. weren't, they have to contact the Register of Deeds from the county of, that they were born. Okay. Does our Register of Deeds assist them with that, or do they? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Very good. And it happens, it happens weekly. Uh, we have uh, information on our website 
that uh, is being used quite heavily. And we have a brochure. A lot of times, the, especially with younger couples, they'll come in and ask, what do we need? Okay. Or they'll go to our website, make a phone call, we'll direct them to the website. And then the past, oh, and the marriage licenses. What's it cost to get a marriage license? $85. $85. And a lot, that is dictated by the state and county statutes. So every time they look at you and say, why does this cost $85? You can say, it's not the county board or the county clerk that's directing this, right. it's the state. Passports, uh, this sounds like they need probably similar information. Yes, um, passports, um, it's not dictated by the state statutes that we take on, uh, we chose to take on that as a county years back. Uh, to be an application acceptance agency for the State Department. And they need um, uh, photo ID, uh, photographs. If they don't have them, we also take those at our office if needed. Um, and the certified uh, birth certificate. Or if they're um, foreign born, they um, more often than not have their naturalization papers, okay. which act as a uh, uh, certified birth certificate. And the cost of getting a passport? Uh, you typically $110 okay. for the passport book. So, so not inexpensive and having uh, received my passport from your office and my full family because we get up to Canada once a year for a right. fishing trip. Uh, I know that when you come in to get that you don't expect to get it over the counter that day. There's a processing right. time because it has to be sent in of what four, six weeks? Four to six weeks is what they say on their website. We are just a passport application acceptance agency. So we assist them in the process, but then we just submit it to the State Department. And if there's any issues or additional information needed there, then the State Department's contacting uh, the applicant directly. Very good, very good. So what do you think is the most common reason you have to send folks home or they can't get it done, whether it's their marriage license or their passport. What do they generally don't have? Typically, it's not the current or proper uh, birth certificate. Okay. But then they go they right up to bring in a to... copy and they say, this is me, what do you mean? Right. Um, and, but it's, it's, a, it's a certified birth certificate. And we just went in and we're changing our website we, it used to say certified copy, uh, and the copy was confusing people. Uh, sure. Although it said it was prefaced by certified, right? it's the certified birth certificate that you need. And when you, we say certified, what does that mean to people? What, what's the difference? They just go in and, and uh, actually look up that you were born there in that county. And then they have to stamp it and notarize it to yep. emphasize that? Yeah. Okay. Very good. The other thing with uh, passports, um, which is um, new to a lot of people, now if you're traveling via car or land travel to um, the contiguous North America, which is Canada, Canada and Mexico, is that you can now get a passport card, uh, which is $30, but it does not allow air travel. So a concern to some, which we bring up, uh, especially if they have uh, young kids or if they have health issues if they're in their older years, is if there's ever need for an emergency to return home via an airplane, mm -hmm. an airplane, uh, you cannot travel with a passport card via air. So um, typically if they're, if they're just going up to Canada to go fishing and they do it every year, and they have no intention of ever flying anywhere and don't have concerns about the uh, emergency to get back home, which is a rare occurrence, but it can still happen. They'll just go with a passport card uh, for the $30. A lot of businessmen uh, will just get the passport card. Truckers, if they're constantly going across the border, it's a license, driver's license size, easily fits in your wallet and uh, it's inexpensive. but um, Similar to a passport, you have to get it renewed every so many 15 years? 15 years. Every 15 years? It's 15. Uh, once you're an adult. If you're a youth, at uh, last, it's good for five years. Five years for children and 15 for an adult. Yeah. yeah. Very good. Well, we only have a couple of minutes left, but uh, I know one of the new initiatives that your office has played a key role in with the county board and the county as a whole right now is the paperless initiative. 
and trying to streamline and all of our county board supervisors now have received iPads and our website's been improved with the agenda development and the minutes. But uh, please take a minute or two to touch on your role there and how you see that developing. Sure. Uh, a lot of this started, uh, the wheel was uh, started rolling with when Julie was in office last year to uh, assist in cost cutting measures for the county. And one of the things that uh, the role of the county clerk's office has is getting out the uh, agenda minutes and any um, attachments to the agenda uh, for financial review, um, other ordinances, whatnot. Sometimes those documents are 40, 60 pages for each of the 25 county supervisors plus yourself, plus for myself and a few others. Uh, so the cost of uh, printing and mailing those out uh, was high every month. So um, in order to combat that, um, some research was done with Terry Hansen, the IT and finance uh, director, along with Julie, and found that um, uh, a lot of counties were going to uh, ulterior paperless method, which uh, the one they chose uh, was with an iPad. Each of the county supervisors will uh, all now have an iPad and over the next few months they'll be getting trained um, on how to use them, how to access the uh, agendas, minutes, and attachments and uh, can just view it right from their screen and call up, they can then call up uh, minutes from past meetings, ordinances from uh, last year they'll be able to look up and then we'll able we'll be able to uh, hopefully by fall we'll have it implemented to uh, replace the uh, board the boardroom voting equipment they'll be able to do it right on their iPads that's outdated equipment that we currently have for the voting um, and uh, we'll be able to implement that soon and um, I think the the Cost payback was uh, less than two years um, on, on that. So right. it's, it's the wave of the future, but it's a cost savings right. uh, all the way around. And it's been kind of fun to see the process unfold. There ha there's been a few hiccups along the way with any change or technology advancement, but uh, I know some of the board members were a little sensitive to making this change. For our children, no big deal, but for some of our board members, there was some concern. But what's been refreshing as many of them already had iPads or were familiar with the technology. And then others that folks may have thought would really struggle have uh, provided feedback that they really like it and that it's, information's more accessible and they're enjoying it. So, so far, so good. Well, we've got to wrap it up, but thank you, John, for joining You're us today. You're very welcome. Excellent information. If you have any questions or suggestions for improvement, or want to follow up with John or his staff and learn more about passports or marriage licenses or any of the areas he covered, please don't hesitate to call the county clerk's office, 459-3003. Yes. Did I get that right? 459-3003. Again, thank you for joining us. Thank you, John. On behalf of Roger Destruti and myself, we'll see you next month.